Hey, good morning, everybody. Would you stand and sing with us this morning?
Jesus. In Psalm 34, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And so, at, you know, as we worship, this is the heart posture that we get to take. And this idea of magnifying the Lord, it's like if you take the magnifying glass and you, you know, highlight something and it like makes it bigger, right? That's what we're doing when we worship. We're putting Jesus in the proper perspective that it's like he is a big deal. We say all the time, he's the most important person in the room. He's the most important person uh, in all of human history and beyond. And I love this line, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Because if, if I'm honest, and maybe you relate to me, that often I, when, when I think about what I'm proud of, what I boast in, what I put my hope in, what I'm confident in, is I want to be confident in, in myself, in my ability to do things, get things done, and make things happen in my life. And the reality is when we come to Jesus, it's like, man, I bring nothing to the table. This is all impossible for me. And so we put Jesus in his prop, proper perspective, and then and it puts me in this place of, man, it humbles me, and it goes, okay, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm not God. Jesus, I'm glad that you're the big deal. I'm glad that you're the main character. And so as we continue to sing, let's just, let's just come to Jesus with that heart posture. Like, Jesus, this is all about you. It's not about me. I know I'm, I've got nothing. <laughs> I bring nothing to the table. I'm, I come poor and needy and crippled. And you're the one who restores me. You're the one who heals me. You're the one that actually gives me worth and value. So as, just as we continue to sing about um, magnifying the Lord, uh, let's let that be our heart posture.
That's what I get for standing out in the cafe talking. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, so every week we just take a little time around now to uh, just kind of give us an opportunity to remember uh, the act of giving because we don't pass offering plates or bags or anything like that. And so um, just as a way to, to just remind you because it's easy to forget, now would be a great time to pull out your phone and do the giving thing. But I just wanted to share a passage with you that I think really impacts me when I think about giving. And I just, I think it's sweet. And so um, this is Matthew chapter six. Jesus is speaking. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And um, I think this thought of where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, really grabs me. We, we have kind of like a, a sort of a similar phrase we use in like American English, which is put your money where your mouth is, right? But we, we kind of have this understanding that where I financially invest is where my heart's invested, right? Whether that's like, you know, a, taking care of your kids or eating <laughs> or, you know, having a house or whatever, or it's the things we enjoy or whatever else. Where we, where we put our money, that's where our heart is. I mean, it could, can be more true. And so Jesus says to invest our heart in heaven. And I think that's really cool. When I, when I think about giving from that perspective, it, it just feels different. It feels, it feels unique to me. And it's something that I think is really sweet that we get to do, that we get to, to say, thank you, God, for all that you've given me. I want to show that I'm invested in you by even putting my money there. Just the same as we want to invest everything else, right? Our time and our heart and, you know, the things that we say and do, we want to invest those into Jesus as well. And so, it's not so much about giving to our church specifically, though if PV is your regular church, church home, I encourage you to consider that. And if it's not, please give to your local church, the one that you go to regularly. But really the, the thing here is, is our hearts, right? Like whenever it comes to money, our hearts come out real quick. Like you see where our hearts at real quick. And there's something really sweet and really powerful about getting to to sort of lay something valuable on the table for Jesus. It's, it's a lot easier to say, oh, I love Jesus, so I follow Jesus, or whatever. It's a lot, a lot more powerful, to me at least, when I, when I get to put something valuable down for Jesus. And so I encourage you to, to, in all things, have an eternal perspective. Think about there, not here. And I heard one pastor talking about this from, he said, you know, if, you're, if you were going and living in another country for like six weeks in a hotel, you wouldn't like buy a bunch of stuff to make your hotel look fancy that you couldn't bring home. You'd put the money into an account that you could access at home. And that's sort of effectively what we're doing when we lay up treasures in heaven, right? We're putting money into an account we can access later. How that works, I have no idea because I don't know what kind of treasure I would need in heaven. But, but, you know, obviously it's important. Jesus talks about it a lot. It must be good. So let's just pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to put our, our money where our mouth is. Um, I know that I really appreciate that I get to give. It's a blessing to me to get to do that. And I know that you've taught me some really cool lessons about trusting you and knowing where all of my resources come from and just some really sweet things from that. And so Lord, I just pray if, if um, any of us need to maybe stretch that muscle, including me, I ask that you would speak to us about that and that we get to have some conversations around giving because I think it's a beautiful thing that we get to do and I, I want to invest in heaven. So thank you for these, these gifts. Amen.
outcry in heaven, like who is, who is worthy to command the events of human history and to unfold this cosmic plan that's beyond anybody's ability in Jesus, you're the one who can do it. That you are the main character of the story. And I know for myself and probably many of us in the room relate that I often make myself the main character. I walk around and spend my day um, as if I am the most important person. And, um, and Jesus, we thank you for moments like this where we just get to remember, remind ourselves and be reminded by you um, that you are, uh, you are the main character of the story, that everything was made by you and for you, that the purpose of our lives is for you, and that we find actually that we find everything that we've been looking for in you. And so we just thank you for that. We pray that you would humble us, give us ears to hear uh, from your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. I'm Sammy Gondola, the missions pastor here at Pleasant Valley. And um, for the last seven years, Lynn Bennett has been serving as the campus minister with InterVarsity here in Winona, reaching students and discipling them. But the Lord has new plans and is starting a new season for her. God has called her to continue to serve with InterVarsity, but in the Manitowoc Lakeshore area in Wisconsin, where she's originally from. Lynn, you are not only a missionary we support, but you've always also been a part of our PV family for 16 years, for a long time, so we will definitely miss you. We will not stop our support. We'll continue to support Lynn in her ministry, but she's just changing locations. We want to pray for you. We want to honor you. We want to bless you as you leave Winona, but uh, would you like to share a few words with, with your PV family? First of all, I want to say a huge thank you. Um, as he said, for the past 16 years, I have called Pleasant Valley and met many of you, love the new faces, and have been able to become a closer follower of Jesus through the ministry here, whether it's the worship, whether it's the messages, um, one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. The college students have captured my heart, and that's the heartbeat that I see certainly being shown here at Pleasant Valley. So I am grateful for your prayer support, the support that helps me to continue to serve college students, but Winona will always have a special spot in my heart. So thank you. Thank you. If you would like to extend your hand and let's pray for Lynn and, and bless her. Lord Jesus, we, we lift up to you, our, your faithful, faithful servant. Lord, we thank you for her life, for her ministry, for her testimony, for all the amazing work that she has done here in Winona, for the foundation that she has laid, for all the the seeds that she has planted, and all the people, all the college students that she has made an impact. It will definitely carry on for years and years into eternity. Or in this new transition, I pray, Lord, that everything will go smoothly, that you will just give her your favor and your grace. You continue to use her mightily. Give her your favor with the new colleges that she's going to be in, that with the faculty and the students there and the staff. Lord, thank you for the faithful, faithful service of your daughter, Lynn. We lift her up to you. Continue to use her. Continue to bless her and provide for her and protect her, Lord. Lord, we thank you. She's a part of our family. She will always be. We give you all the glory for all that you have done and for what you will do in this new season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning, my name is Abigail, one of the interns here, and we've got a few announcements for you today. Good morning, PV families. I'm Kirsten, the Director of Children's Ministry. And I'm Jen, Director of Student Ministries. Because the school year is coming to an end, this is the time of year when some of our children and students will make an important step up into the next level of ministry programming. Sunday, June 12th is Step Up Day. On that day, your child, preschool and older, will be considered the next grade or age higher and will begin going to that grade's ministry programs. For example, in our children's ministry, our current preschoolers that will be going into kindergarten next year will move over to the kindergarten room. Kindergartners will move to our first grade room, and so forth. Now we can't just let our kids move up without celebrating. So on June 6th, during both of our services, we will be having a graduation celebration during Kids Church for all preschoolers and fourth graders. We will be celebrating everything that our kids have been able to learn over the year, as well as prepare each of them for the new transition. On June 12th, children who just wrapped up fourth grade will be considered part of our student ministry and will be invited to join the RISE fifth and sixth grade class that same day. This summer, RISE meets on Sunday mornings at either 8.30 or 10.30 service for hangout time, games, a Bible lesson, and a little bit of small group discussion. RISE also meets every other Sunday evening for fun summer activities that build friendship and community. Our first Summer Rise event is a family trivia and bingo night here at PV at 6.30 on June 12th. Lastly, if you're just completing sixth grade, you will be considered a Thrive student this summer. Thrive meets weekly on Wednesday evenings at 5.45 for a summer chapel, followed by various summer activities afterwards. Current sixth graders are welcome to attend either Rise or Thrive summer activities making this what we in student ministry call the best summer ever. Move Up Day applies to all ages except for our babies and toddlers as we move our youngest church members up based on developmental stages. When your baby is able to steadily walk, they can move over to the toddler room and toddlers can move as soon as they are both potty trained and at least two years old. We are so excited for all of you and we're grateful that we get to come alongside you and your family during these monumental years of life. Join us June 5th at 8.30 and 10.30 service for Worship Sunday. This is an hour-long time of worship, prayer, and being in community. The Traditions venue will also be open at 10.30 a.m. as normal. We hope to see you there. Camp Awesome is getting closer. Happening June 22nd through the 24th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Camp Awesome is a sports, arts, or science camp for children entering first grade through fifth grade. Kids will have the option to choose classes from soccer, basketball and track and field, baking, visual arts and theater, or physics, chemistry, and engineering. Cost is $40. Please register and sign your kids up for an awesome experience. If you're looking for ways to get involved here at PV, we're looking for more staff to help out for Camp Awesome. Opportunities are available for adults and teens that love Jesus and children to serve as small group leaders, registration staff, food staff, and a lot more. No athletic, artistic, or science ability is needed. Just willing helping hands. This is a great way to bless our community and have a ton of fun. To sign up to help, please go to pvwinona.com slash calendar slash camp awesome or contact Kirsten for more information at kirsten at pvwinona.com. Take a look at the PV Winona app, the happenings, or our website to find out more about everything going on here, including our Thrive End of Year Block Party happening Wednesday, June 1st, 7 p.m. here at PV, and H2O Summer Chapel happening on Mondays at 7 p.m. off-site. If you're new today or have any questions, stop by the Next Steps area on the cafe. If you'd like to worship through the act of giving, you can do that through the website, the app, or the black boxes at the back or just outside of the Ministry Center. That's it from me. We're so glad you joined us this morning. I was trying to guess how long that sucker is. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Some of you guys are asleep, huh? Weather, weather getting you a little tired? 
Well, I am glad to have you guys here. Um, before we get started this morning, I just want to recognize Memorial Day tomorrow. First, just want to say thank you to anybody who served in the military, but specifically we want to just recognize those of uh, family or friends who have lost loved ones um, serving in the military. We just thank you for their sacrifice and uh, recognize what they've done for our country. Um, just want to say glad you're here, whether you're here in person or online. We're glad that you have decided to join us this morning. We have been in the book of Acts, where uh, we just finished up Acts chapter 5. We're stepping into Acts chapter 6 today. Last chapter, uh, we saw the unfortunate story of Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, and then we got to see a really cool miracle. So uh, kind of an up and down situation there. Um, this week, we're going to see a transition begin. Um, up to this point, the focus has really been in Palestinian Jews, the sort of uh, center of Jerusalem, if you will. And we're going to start to see the story unfold in sort of concentric rings uh, going out. And it's actually really cool. I encourage you to pay attention as we go through the, the chapters, um, because you're going to start to, to sort of see this really cool plan of God's unfold for the church, where it starts in this very concentrated way, and it just keeps going out further and further like a ripple. Uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful picture. It's really cool to see the way that God laid this out. Um, and so we're going to start that process today. Um, but before we begin, I would love to uh, just pray for us. So let's do that. Father, thank you for the opportunity to get into your word um, and, and spend some time studying it together, Lord. I know that um, I have nothing to offer apart from what you have to offer. That your spirit and your word needs to do the work. Um, otherwise, we'll get nothing out of this. And Lord, I, I ask that um, you would just speak really clearly to us, whether that's as a group um, or in individual hearts, um, the things that you want us to hear and learn and focus on and catch today. Pray that you would soften our hearts and prepare us, allow us to just experience what you have for us today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, let me read you the first verse here, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of background information because you're, you're going to need it to really understand what's going on. So, the first verse in chapter 6 says, Now, in these days, uh, the disciples were increasing in number, and a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Uh, so there's several things I want to kind of explain or address in this one sentence. Uh, the first thing, just real quick, when you see disciples in this chapter, it does not mean the twelve. If it means the twelve, it will say the twelve. Disciples in this chapter means Christians. That simple. Just disciples of Jesus, people who follow Jesus, Christians. At this point in time, the term Christian is not yet in use. Uh, and we'll see that in, I think it's chapter 12 or 13 of Acts when it first comes into play. So for now, anytime you see the word disciples, it means all, all of the Christians at that time, the whole group, uh, of which there's probably like 8,000-ish, if we, if we can guess based on the numbers that have increased from the couple of preaching times, and maybe there's more. Um, it's a little hard to say because we don't have specific numbers, but um, so that's what it's referring to, is, is Christians as a whole. Um, Hellenist is an interesting word that by itself basically just means Greek influenced and specifically kind of the, the Greek culture's kind of um, a person who is adapted into the Greek culture. A lot of times that would include speaking Greek language, uh, being into their like cultural dynamics and kind of doing things the way they would do them. Uh, in this context specifically, the Hellenists are a group of Jews who are kind of Greekish Jews. Okay, and the way that this works, because this is a little confusing, and sometimes your Bible will just have a footnote that says something like Greek-speaking Jews, which is true, but not very clear. There's more to it. So these would be Jews who had been exported out of Jerusalem or out of Israel at some point in time in the past. Them are obviously their ancestors. And then at some point in time in the past, either them or their ancestors migrated back to Israel. And so because of this process, they've been in these Greek cultures. They've started to become very Greek-ish, 
right? And uh, an interesting note I read is that uh, Jews actually were some of the best at preserving their own culture in these, in these situations, in these settings, which is kind of cool. But obviously they were still pretty influenced by it because they're called Hellenists, right? And so these Jews move back in to, uh, to Israel and the uh, we will call them Palestinian Jews, the ones that did not move. Those Jews looked at them as second-class citizens because they weren't real Jews, right? They had left the country. They hadn't stayed in the Holy Lands, right? And so, so there's a, a tension there. And it's not, it doesn't seem to be an extreme tension. We don't see like a lot of crazy stuff happening, but there's kind of like a class dynamic at play here. Right, and so uh, the, the Hellenists are kind of a lower class, kind of a little bit mistreated. The Palestinian Jews kind of snub them effectively. So it's important to know that because everybody at this point in time that's becoming a believer in Jesus, almost every one of them is a Jew. We haven't yet really gone out to the Gentiles or that kind of thing. There's, there's a handful here and there, but for the most part, they're Jews. And we call them completed Jews, which are just Jews that believe that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And so uh, it's helpful to remember that everybody in this setting right now are, uh, are of Jewish descent and they're Jewish believers that have put their trust in Jesus as their Messiah. So when you, when you have that dynamic at play, they're importing kind of their old prejudices into Christianity. They're not necessarily resolving that prejudice of, oh, but those aren't, because, it, because for them, this is still Judaism. This is not a new thing. This is not Christianity. This is just Judaism finished, right? And so it's, everything's kind of still the same for them, except they believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And so those uh, biases have imported into the church. So the, uh, the dynamic at play here is that the Hellenists are complaining to the Palestinian Jews that, hey, our widows aren't being taken care of. Now, again, this is a little bit uh, confusing for a modern reader because, you know, we have government agencies and all kinds of stuff and retirement funds and all that kind of stuff, social security, all that comes into play for a widow. At this period of time, though, the, the, the plan or the design for a woman, specifically a woman who was elderly and had lost her husband, would be that she'd be taken care of by family members because she wouldn't typically work. However, uh, if there were no family members around, then taking care of her fell to the responsibility of the church, the Jewish church, if you will, right? And since, again, these these people are effectively Jews importing into Christianity. They understand that, hey, widows are our responsibility. And so the church has taken up this responsibility of taking care of the widows, right? God said a lot about this in the Old Testament. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll see him again. And in fact, in the New Testament as well, he talks a lot about the widows and the orphans because those were the two groups of people who could not take care of themselves and there was no system to protect them or take care of them, right? So who needed to take care of them? Us. Right? There's no one else to do it, right? And so you have these widows that do not have any means of support, these Hellenist widows who are not being taken care of by the church. They've probably been kind of ostracized by their Jewish brethren. And so they don't have resources, which is a real problem. And we're not talking about like, you know, fancy things. We're talking about like food, right? It's a real issue. And so the Hellenists bring this uh, to the attention of the Hebrews and are like, hey, what's, what's going on here? Now, one more sort of background information thing here. Um, if you've ever wondered, because I, I wonder this every time I read this passage, why are there so many widows? Like you wouldn't think there'd be that many people that wouldn't have a family member to take care of them. You, you would think that'd be a pretty small number of people. Well, this is interesting. So apparently at this period of time, Jews believed it was best to die in Israel. And so, and, and specifically in Jerusalem, if they could. And so what was happening was that these couples were moving to Jerusalem in their old age so they could make sure to die in Jerusalem. But the man would die first and the woman would be left behind with no family members around. She doesn't want to move out of Jerusalem because she wants to die in Jerusalem and she has no one to take care of her. So you can kind of see how the dynamics would kick into play here. And this is just a fun fact. Uh, at this time, at least one source said, and I don't know how prevalent this was, they didn't say, but one source said that uh, there was a teaching going on that uh, if you died somewhere other than Israel, 
you would have to roll under the ground back to Israel. So, I doubt that's true. <laughs> that seems highly suspicious. Um, but it's interesting, all the same. So that might have been contributing to why they wanted to make sure because they didn't want to have to roll underground. Um, at any rate, we had a lot of widows in this place and they were not having their needs met and so they were struggling, right? And so the word distribution here, the being neglected in their daily distribution, that word is actually just uh, the, the word, I'm going to look at it because I always get it wrong, diakonia, which is the, the, the root word for that is dia, dia, uh, dia on us, which is where we get the word for deacon. Okay, so this word just means to serve. Okay, that's the most simplest explanation. I mean, you can, it has lots of different meanings, but, but you can just boil it down to serve. So the daily serving. In other words, this may not have just been food. It might have been money and other things just being taken care of. They were not being taken care of. They're being neglected in this daily caretaking process. Okay, so with all that background information in mind, <laughs> we're now ready to actually dive into it a little bit. And so it says the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples, which is a lot of disciples, the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we, the 12, should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So our English translation and kind of our culture sort of, uh, loses this a little bit, it gets a little confusing when, he, when it says, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. You kind of like have this immediate thought of, well, that's not very Christian, right? <laughs> like it sounds kind of bad, right? <laughs> but it's because we're kind of missing the nuance in what's happening here. Note that they don't say it's not right that we should serve tables. That's, that's not what they're saying. It's not that they're saying it's not right that we should serve tables. It's saying it's not right that we should exchange one thing for the other. Okay, and so if you think about this, the 12 are the people who, well, 11 and then one was added, are the people who spent the time with Jesus here on earth, learned directly from him the most, right? Took in all this information. Jesus has given them a very specific job, which is to then teach everyone that, right? They're like currently, the, they're the ones that've got everything locked up in their heads, right? There's no Bible, Right? They can't just be like, well, just read this. Right? They're the ones that are going to lead to the authoring of the Bible. Right? And so they have a very, very important job to do, which is to share what they know with everyone, to teach everyone. And so they say, hey, it would be wrong of us to give up doing this thing that has been clearly assigned to us by God to go do a different job. It's not an act of laziness. It's not like they just didn't want to do it or something like that. They're just recognizing that they have a very, very specific job God has given them that they need to do, right? Very different than maybe how it sounds at first glance. It says, you know, it, the, another way you could translate this is it's not appropriate for us to do this, right? It wouldn't be appropriate. It'd be weird for them to cut back on their teaching to go do this other thing that other people could do, right? And so, uh, it says, therefore, brothers, pick out from amongst you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Notice here what the qualifications are. This is really interesting, right? So we're talking about serving tables here, right? Our first thought, maybe, if you were appointing someone to serve tables, would be like, anybody got a warm body? right? Like if you can do this, <laughs> we'll take you, right? But that's not the case. That's not what they're thinking. Instead, what they want is people who are wise, full of the spirit, and have good reputations, which should tell you something about what's happening in this particular position, right? This is, this is a little fuller of a position than maybe it seems at first glance, right? And the interesting thing is, this might actually be the first time that we see deacons appear in the Bible, now, it's not, they're not specifically described as deacons. We can't prove that. The, the, like the official setting up of the office of the deacon happens later. But this might be sort of the ancestry of being a deacon. And so deacon is a person who serves and has some leadership role, right? And so these guys are going to be taking responsibility for money and food, which are both significant things in this period of time. They're also probably going to be doing some teaching and preaching, right? 
They're going to be hands-on with these individuals, so they're going to be ministering to them spiritually. And so the disciples don't want just any Joe Schmo to do this job. They want men that are properly equipped to do it. Right, which is, which is kind of a cool picture of, of what this, this role is going to look like, right? And so, so it says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, this is interesting. The word ministry there, we translate it a lot of different ways. That is also the word that we get the word deacon from. It's the same word. So they use the same word. Again, we miss this in English. It's really unfortunate. They use the same word for both jobs. In other words, They'll serve one way, we'll serve another. Everybody's serving. Which is a really cool picture when you think about it. And if you think about it, these guys were probably working really hard. Like long, intense days of serving. Because that would be normal in their culture, right? Like today we're like, oh, an hour of serving. <laughs> no, I got things to do, right? But like in their, in their culture, like this, this, they would just commit. They would go all in on these kind of things, right? And so these guys are probably working really, really hard to serve. Whether they're serving by teaching and preaching and prayer or they're serving by taking care of this other ministry to widows, either way they're serving, right? There, there's there's a of beginning clue that we might want to be considering serving. After all, that's exactly what Jesus did. Laid down his very life for us. So, it's interesting to me that they use the same word. And this doesn't mean that the 12 won't ever serve tables or that the seven won't ever do preaching and teaching, as we're about to see. Rather, it just means that they know their assignment the thing they're responsible for. God has assigned them to this unique thing that, hey, this is your charge. I want you to take care of this, right? And it's really actually very important for us to know what God has assigned us to. This is something we want to do too. We want to know what God has assigned us to. What things has God put in our care that we alone are responsible for and that we need to make sure happen, right? And so whether that, I mean, that, that could be simple things like my job, my family, you know, taking care of things, whatever. Or it could be ministry things, right? God has perhaps given you a particular ministry or particular relationships. We want to know what God has assigned to us and we want to tend to those things, right? We don't want to ignore them. We don't want to miss them. We want to take care of them. It wouldn't be right for us to do some other thing instead of taking care of the thing God has assigned us to. But... On the flip side, we want to be careful not to become the people that say, well, that's not my job. That's really easy to do. The, the number one place I see this, this is, this is kind of a funny one because I don't think we even realize when we do it. The that's not my job thing comes up a lot in evangelism. Well, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my job. Right? But the, the reality is, yeah, that might not be your primary responsibility, but God wants to use you for things, right? And those things are going to deviate from the primary things he's given you. They might surprise you, right? And so we want to have like a, a kind of a balance going on here. We don't want to exclude or ignore the things God has carefully assigned us to. We want to make sure those things are taken care of, but we also want to be soft to what else God might want us to do. And again, we're going to see Stephen put this into practice. So, it says next, And what said pleased the whole gathering, which that's a lot of people to agree on something. And they, <laughs> can you imagine? And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting to me that he's the only one that gets called out as a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Remember, this was kind of the requirement for all of them. So they, this is probably all true for all of them, but either he was maybe just like a little step further or something. There was something about Stephen that's like, man, that guy, right? And then, and here we go with a bunch of names that are difficult to pronounce, and I've written down the pronunciation, so I won't bot butcher it. Uh, <clears throat> and Philip, I can do that one. And Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas. I was told that I missed an obvious joke with Parmesan cheese there. Um, and Nicolaus, uh, a proselyte, I had trouble with that word, uh, from Antioch. These, they set before the disciples and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So they, they commissioned them into this, this responsibility, this role. Again, potentially the first sort of opportunity for deaconing. 
<clears throat> the men were selected probably because they were Hellenists. There's a good chance. They all, all have Greek names. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they were Hellenists because Jews oftentimes had Greek names. We see that with Paul. Right, Paul Saul, that's his Greek and his Hebrew name. Um, but there's a good chance these guys were Hellenists. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because who better to know the needs of that group of people than people from that group of people? Right now they have some representation to look, look after their needs and make sure that, because we don't know what the cause was before. Maybe it was prejudice. Maybe it was just a mistake, right? Maybe it was just like, oh, we didn't even think about the Hellenists, you know, kind of a thing. Well, now they have people that are looking to their needs that kind of get to communicate with the 12 on a more direct basis, right? So now they're getting taken care of. It makes good sense. Um, it's also interesting to me how the early church was concerned with both taking care of the physical and the spiritual here. Right? A lot of times we get heavy on one or the other. We like swing back and forth. <laughs> right? Like we either get really fixated on like taking care of some physical issues, physical needs, which isn't, it's not bad that we do that, but we don't want to lose sight of the spiritual needs tied into those. Or vice versa, we get so focused on the spiritual needs that we're almost like, ah, the body doesn't matter. You'll be fine. You know, like in, in reality, we should be taking care of both. That's, that's, what God's asked us to do is take care of both things. And so they do a really excellent job of kind of keeping, to, keeping track of both things and taking care of both things in the way they assigned this group of people. So it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And get this, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's a good sign, Right? This is, this is a cool thing, right? So we basically, essentially what Luke is telling us is it worked, <laughs> right? Like now both groups are being covered. Everything's being taken care of. The disciples can still do what they need to do and the church is growing. Hooray, right? And that's essentially the, the whole bit of that story that you get, right? That's the only information you're ever gonna hear. You're never gonna hear about what happened with this beyond that, right? It's everything seems to work. There were no more complaints. Everything was good. Which is why this is a weird chapter to preach on. Because <laughs> it's, it's sort of informational in nature, this first section and the second section. So now we're going to take a slight turn and we're going to talk about Stephen specifically, right? We know where Stephen has come from now. He was assigned to the seven. Let's talk about him specifically, right? Let's get into his story. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So whenever you see a statement like great wonders and signs— that means like miracles, right? Like maybe he was healing people or, you know, casting out demons or doing something, big things, right? That's, that's not just to say he was just doing a good job teaching, which they also cover. There's big stuff happening here, right? God is using Stephen in a really interesting, cool way, right? Up till now, the only people being used this way, the 12, Stephen's getting a unique opportunity here. God's using him in a cool way. And here's why I think that might have happened. Just a guess. I don't know. I think Stephen was willing to serve in whatever way God wanted him to. He got assigned into this, into this responsibility of taking care of the tables. And God's like, great, I gave you a little thing. You're doing the little thing. Let's do something bigger. Right? Jesus, Jesus talked about this idea of, you know, you were faithful with much, I'll give you more kind of a thing. And I think that's more in the context of eternity, but I think we can apply it here too, right? And so it's really cool to me, and I, this isn't like, oh, well, if you serve tables, you're going to get to do miracles. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I think this just gives you a cool picture of what happens when someone is ready and willing, right? Didn't have that attitude of not my job or whatever. He's like, hey, you want me to teach? I'll teach. You want me to, you know, share witness, you know, witness of Jesus and use wisdom. I'll do that. Sure. Right. And so it says, then some of those who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen, which are probably also Hellenists, um, as it was called, and some of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and some of the, and I cannot say this word, Cilicia, Cilicia, I really have trouble with that word. You know, when I was a kid, I could not say the word Mitsubishi to save my life. I will just always tumble in my mouth. And that's what it feels like now. Um, and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. So they're like, this guy is way too successful. We need to, you know, 
convince him he's wrong. We need to, we need to fight with him, right? And so this, you know, debate essentially is occurring with Stephen. And now it doesn't say this, so we don't know for sure, but I wonder if Stephen might be some of the reason why some of the priests are converting. And I wonder if that's part of why they're like, we got to put a stop to this. Even the priests are leaving, right? Which again, it's, you know, you have to remember that they still consider this to be Jewishness. They're not leaving their Jewishness. They're just completing their Jewishness. And so he's doing all kinds of other ministry, which is really cool. He's taking care of his primary thing, obviously, because there hasn't been any issues. And he's also being used for these other things. He's just open to what God wants to do with him. He's ready to serve, right? Which, by the way, is hard. Right? That, that's, a, that's a dying to self activity. To be open, to be ready to serve, to be ready to, all right, God, you want me to do that? I'll do that. You want me to talk to my neighbor? I'll talk to my neighbor. You want me to serve in kids ministry? I'll serve in kids. You know, like, that's hard. It's hard to, to stay in that kind of open place, but we're called to it. We're called to surrender everything, including our time. So Stephen is really just, if you think about the story of a normal guy who's willing to do what God asks. There's nothing particularly unique about Stephen himself, right? He wasn't even one of the 12 apostles. He's just a Christian. That's it. Beyond that, nothing unusual about him. But he apparently is just ready to be used. And so he's used a lot. And he's full of God's power. And similarly, he was just ready to kind of do whatever God sent him into. And so what it says, a chapter, or verse 10 says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. In other words, he was just trample, trampling all over them with what he was saying. Right? Like we've, we've seen this happen rarely, but it does happen, right? Where someone is just like so quick on their feet and just has all the right answers that you just can't muster up a response to them. God's using Stephen that way. It, to the point where they're like, like flustered, right? They're like, we can't, there's nothing we can do. This guy's like so good at this and so full of some other thing, right? They're identifying something's going on with him. They may not realize it's the spirit. At least I hope they don't realize it's the spirit because otherwise, what the heck guys? But they, they can see something's different about Stephen, right? And they're like, we can't stand up to this guy. He's just, you know, full of God's power and just capable. And so, what do they do? Same plan as before. They secretly instigate men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. If this doesn't sound familiar to you, you need to go back and read Jesus' story. This is the same exact thing, even the same charge. Oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple and raise it three days later. Now it's, oh, he said that he said that he was going to destroy the temple. It's the same situation. Same old sin, right? Let's make something up about him because we can't stop him. Which should tell you that Stephen was on the right track because he's going to be treated exactly like his Lord. I mean, this is, this is just like tit for tat, exactly. And you know, the other thing that's interesting to me is that they specifically in the story they trump up, they talk about how he is profaning the, this place and he's profaning the law. Nothing about God in there, right? They say blasphemed, blasphemed against God, but then when it comes push to shove, they just talk about their religious activities. They're upset because he's messing with their religious activities. He's insulting their religious activities. Whether he was or not, that's what gets them fired up. That's what gets the council fired up. Their religious activities are being messed with. Be careful that you don't fall for the same trap. It is really easy to become a religious Christian with no relationship with Jesus. It's a really dangerous place to be. Following Jesus is not attending church. It's not reading your Bible. 
It's not saying the right things or being a good moral person. It's having a commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord. Nothing short of that can save you. Be very, very careful not to fall into this trap. Now, don't get me wrong. All those things are good things. Please keep coming to church. All those things are good things, but they are nothing more than us obeying our Lord. They're nothing more than us growing in our Lord. Ultimately, it comes back to Jesus, not those activities, not those behaviors. The reason we want to be good people is not because it earns us credit with God, but because Jesus is our Lord. The reason we want to go to church, the reason we want to read our Bible, is because Jesus is our Lord. Don't confuse them. It's really, really important. So Stephen is experiencing persecution. And based on the response of the other disciples in situations of persecution, I would guess he's joyful about it. Which is weird to us. That's hard to get your head around, right? When the disciples walk away from a beating rejoicing, that's hard to get your head around. It's hard to be like, yeah, that sounds great, guys. Like, but I think that something happens in the midst of facing persecution for Jesus. I think that something happens in that moment that, that changes the experience because you identify with your Lord in that moment. You feel this new sense of identification with Jesus. And I would imagine that's pretty exciting. Right? There's, there's something cool to be persecuted for your faith. Even though it's scary and hard and challenging, there's also something powerful about it because it, it, it shows the realness of your faith, the realness of what you think and believe. So there's a good chance that the aggressors are Hellenists, as I mentioned. And it's possible that these guys aren't even going after him for like theological reasons. It might be just that they're embarrassed. Because remember, they're second-class citizens compared to the Palestinian Jews. They want the Palestinian Jews to see how serious they are as Jews. It could be nothing more than to, to look good, which is unfortunate. But here's the cool thing, and, 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 and this verse really got me as I was preparing and reading about this, because I was like, what on earth? Verse 15 says, And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I'm not entirely sure what that actually means. In fact, as I read commentaries and stuff like that, nobody else does either. <laughs> There are two theories that I saw come up as I was reading, two, two different explanations of what exactly that means, what precisely it means. The first one is that maybe his face was sort of like Moses' face when he spent time on the mountain with God and he came back and his face was like kind of glowing. He had to wear the veil and all that stuff, if you remember that story. Or even like when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain and he was glowing. It could be something along those lines. It could be kind of a glow or something that is supernatural in looks. Or it could be something a little more uh, practical. It could be simply, he was at peace. He was calm. He wasn't flustered by, by what they were saying or what they were doing. He wasn't, he wasn't enraged. He wasn't responding. He was just still waiting on his Lord. And I think it's okay to maybe think both. I don't think there's anything wrong with maybe it was both. Either way, they missed the in implications of it because they kept going from there. I, I really liked this, uh, this comment from the Holman New Testament commentary. So let me just read it to you. It says, we can almost see Stephen making eye contact with the high priest and other members of the council. What they saw must have startled them. No anger, no fear, no bitterness. Instead, a quiet confidence, peace, Security and courage obviously brought on by the presence of the Holy Spirit and God's grace in his life. Even at that, Luke's choice of words seems remarkable. His face was like the face of an angel. So, imagine what he would have to feel like. Imagine what would have to be going on inside of him to be like that, right? Right? Make no mistake, Stephen knows exactly who the people he is facing are. 
and exactly what they did to his Lord. And I don't want to give any spoilers, but it doesn't end well. Stephen knows the danger he's in in this situation. He is not under any sort of delusion. He knows this could be the end of him right here. So why is he so calm? Why is his face like the face of an angel? Because he was relying on the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Remember, that was like the description we got of Stephen over and over again in this passage. He's full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen has learned the, I don't want to call it a trick, but the, the ability, if you will, to let the Spirit lead him. And he does it really well. And in the moment of facing his possible death, facing an angry mob of people who basically were leading a kangaroo court, Stephen's calm. He knows this isn't his home. He knows where he's going. And so he's okay with what happens. And I think it's well worth asking a question inwardly in ourselves, what would I do? How would I respond? Because, I mean, nothing really presses on our faith more than facing the idea of having to stand up for our faith knowing that we'll get killed for it, right? That, that really puts things in, in perspective. It really presses on our faith. And so I would encourage you to take a moment to consider what would I do? What would I do in a setting like this? Now, I want to say this because I'm a, I'm a big believer in this. I do think that God gives us some extra help in these situations. Uh, Corey Ten Boom tells the story of her father um, saying that she, she was afraid. She was thinking about this idea when she was a kid. What would, what would happen if I would, if I would get killed um, for my faith? And she was asking her dad, like, what if, I, what if I wouldn't do it or whatever? And he said, when we go to get on a train, do I give you your ticket weeks in advance? She said, no, you give it to me right before we get on the train. And he said, well, the Lord will give you what you need right before it happens. And I can't prove that that's true, but I think that's probably true. I think that's a fair assumption. And so I don't want anybody panicking right now <laughs> as they think about this. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I would, right? The, the idea here is not to invoke this, oh, I'm a bad Christian. I'm a bad follower of Jesus. The idea is to draw up what's going on deep down, right? Because we, we have a tendency to create a veneer on the outside, right? Like, I'm, I'm a pretty good Christian. I kind of got things figured out, right? And our heart still needs work. We don't really ever want to get to that place where we're, like, comfortable with where we're at, right? We, we want to be aware of the things that we still need to grow in sanctification in and grow in faith in. And this is a great question to ask to find those things. I'm going to invite the band back up. So I encourage you, take some time and ask this question of yourself. Hey, what would I do? What would I do in a situation like that? How would I handle this? Would I be quick to go to the Lord and ask for help? Or would I try to squirm out of the situation? What would I do? And if you find your answer to that question, not what you want it to be, don't look at that as a, a massive failure. Look at that as a great opportunity. That's a great opportunity to do some business with the Lord and say, Lord, I, I, I'm, I know I would respond wrong to this. Would you help me? I want to be like Stephen in these situations. Or not just in these situations, but just in general, right? In life, like when someone cuts me off on the road or, you know, someone's being a little mean to me, you know, or whatever. I want to respond like Stephen would respond because he's listening to the Spirit, letting the Spirit lead his life. Would you teach me to do that? Would you teach me how to be like that? Be led by the Spirit. And just as a quick side note, I also encourage you to find where he's inviting you to serve. Be a person ready to serve the people around you. Serve those around you. That's what Jesus asks us to do. And I know it's not easy and it goes against our inner nature to look up for number one. And that's another place we can grow. So let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the incredibly powerful example of Stephen. And I know as we get into next week, um, 
we're going to get to see that on display even more. And, and I really appreciate Stephen's story because I think in a lot of ways, he's just a regular guy. And we get to see what it looks like to put our trust in Jesus in, in really remarkable ways. Put our lives on the line and say, hey, I, this is not my home. If I've got to go, I'm ready. That's hard. Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful that we can rely on you to grow us in those things, to prepare us for those things. I know that apart from you, I, I lack any amount of good faith or good attitude that I really need you to do sanctification in my life to make me more like Jesus. And I know I'll need that the rest of my life. And so I pray, Lord, in this moment and throughout today, would we be just considering, hey, what would I do if I were in Stephen's shoes? What would I do? Would I be able to respond with the face of an angel or would it look like something else? Lord, we just thank you for this time in your word and we just ask, would you continue to teach us? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we end our time with a song.
One last thought. It is really, really important to remember the reason why we do these things. Right? The reason is really, really simple. Jesus plucked us out of hell. Jesus saved us from our own sins. Jesus gave us a bright hope and a future in eternity with him in heaven. And that's what we look forward to. This world, this life, not our home. It's not going to last. It's not meant to last. That's going to last for eternity. And so when Jesus asks for something from us, that's an easy give because of what he's done for us, because of where we're headed. This is not our home. That is. And so let's hold on to that as we think about these things. Anytime we're looking at becoming more like Jesus, we have to remember why. It's because of all he's done for us. We're happy to become more like him. We want to let go of the things that ensnare and entangle. We want to become more like Jesus. And ultimately, we want to be willing to give him anything he asks. Because man, has he given us a lot. God bless you. Have a good week.